listening to Cooper Talk. Welcome to Cooper Talk. I'm your host, Steve Cooper, and remember, I'm only as hip as my guests. I gotta tell you something, people. My guest today is, is you know, well, I met him years ago he, he was in Burbank, but he, I saw him play when he was with the Yes in, ninth, in the Spectrum, probably in 1980, and he's also, he was one of the founders of Bubbles. He is one of the founders of Asia, all one, wonderful bands, and I just listened to his album, his newest album, with the Downs Braid Association, which it's just great. And my guest is Jeff Downs. How you doing, Jeff? How you doing? Good to see you. Good to see you. It's funny. I I, I, said, I knew you back then. It was such a long time ago. I see the Fantasia Pool Hall and Burbank Bar and Grill and all those old haunts that Burbank Bar and Grill's gone. It's just great to see you now. And uh, it's I, I know you're back in England. Yeah, back in Wales, actually. So so what, what made you decide to leave L.A.? I mean... Everyone's leaving LA anyway, <laughs> so it's not, everyone's yeah. tired of it. What made you decide to leave? Uh, I think that um, it wasn't really my scene, you know, particularly. I think that uh, I've always been very much uh, uh, a British person that, uh, you know, I get my inspiration for being on these shores. I mean, I love America. I love, uh, I love touring America. We've had some fantastic moments over there. So, um, yeah, I think... Uh, you know, you, you kind of move around. You, you you get you stick in a place that you feel comfortable with. Now, tell me about the new album, the Downs Braid Association, which I believe he's based in LA. And I know technology has changed, so you could record across the sea. Uh, but how did how did you guys collaborate in the very beginning? Because I know this is your, I believe, your fourth project with him. Well, I think we first met. Uh, we, we we did a Buggles. Uh, Reformation gig back in 2010. Jeff was, um, you know, introduced us, and, and Chris said, "I was always a big Buggles fan. I'd love to work with you one day." And so it really, it, it came out of that really. And I think that, um, you know, working with Chris has been a real revelation, you know, for me because uh, he was such a big Buggles fan, and uh, you know, it was his kind of thing. Wanted to work with us. That was great. Okay, so so Jeff, how how did you start the uh, Downs Braid Association? Well, it was a thing we did. Um, I was explaining that um, we did a gig with the Buggles, um, our first real gig back in two thousand and ten, um, and Chris was working with Trevor on a band called the Producers, and. Um, uh, and I met him through that, and he, was, he told me at the time, he said, look, I'm a big Buggles fan. I'd love to do some writing with you sometime. Uh, and it just so happened that uh, he was moving, in the process of moving to Los Angeles, and I was uh, over in Los Angeles working on the Fly From Here album with Yas. And so um, Chris and I started to get together and started working on some material back in uh, early 2011, almost, uh, I'd say, 10 years to the day. And, um, you know, and since then, we, we've, we've had this kind of remote relationship where I've sent him some ideas and he's worked on them, sent them back. So it's been, um, it, it's an interesting way of working. And I think that, you know, if you look at where situations are now with, uh, with the lockdowns and everything, it's been much more the normal way of, of people have been collaborating uh, making music together, so uh, we were kind of there in the early stages, I think. Now, how is it for an artist when you're used to working in a studio with the person you're working with? Is it? It's. I know this is the way the course of action people are doing it now. They can record music everywhere, but is it? Do you feel more comfortable when you're in a studio with the person you're working with, or do you feel more comfortable when you're not with them, and then you can just send them your own product? Well, I think there's, there's two there's two schools of thought on that. I think that you know it was great in the in the old days because that was the only way you could do it was to be in, in one room with all the other guys, and um, you know obviously some fantastic music came out of that environment. And uh, certainly when you know when I, we did the bubble stuff and and, uh, and and yes and Asia and all of that kind of stuff, it was very much a case of. You know, we were all in the same room and we worked on the stuff together, and that you know that had its rewards. I think because you know you had that instant rapport with somebody where you could change something, someone would make a suggestion, uh, and and it was very much you know a very creative process. But I think 
you know, as time has gone by, the sophistication of communication and uh, file sharing and all of that has, has opened, uh, you know, a lot of doors for people to work with maybe, you know, other people that you wouldn't have had the opportunity of working with. And so, you know, I think that, um, you know, that there's, there's, good, there's good size to both schools of thought. And, and I, I'd like to think that, you know, at some stage, you know, I can go back to working in a room with, with someone and, um, you know, exchanging ideas on a very uh, you know, personal level. But um, certainly for the time being, I think that because of this, this whole pand- pandemic and, uh, you know, the way that everyone's been locked down for this last year or so, there hasn't really been any any opportunity for people to to work in close proximity together. So it, it's, you know, it's the way that it is. You just have to kind of work with work around what you've got. Now you, you you and you and uh, you come from two different music worlds with the, the new band. How did you guys? How did you come with the sound you you've come up with? Because it's it's a very sound. It's 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 a progressive sound sound, but it's also has some upbeat. How did you come up with that sound? Because as I said, you know, and I've read reviews of this album. People are loving this album. Well, I think it's an interesting combination. I think from where I originally came from a, you know, I suppose a pop background, although prior to that, you know, I, I, when I was at music college, I was studying a lot of um, jazz rock, and I was really into bands like, you know, uh, Chick Corea, and the late Chick Corea, sadly passed recently, and um, uh, Herbie Hancock, and people like that, so those were the keyboard players that were really driving me at the time, but I was also very much into Yes, and, you know, the Canterbury bands like Caravan, and <coughs> sorry, Soft Machine, so, you know, it, 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 it's a way of, I suppose, a way of making a living that, you, that I move more into the pop field. And I think that Chris was, you know, in a similar way, he, you know, he was driven into that, that zone in order to be able to be creative and make a living. So, you know, the fact that I moved into the progressive uh, scene very very quickly after the Boggles, but obviously being into Yes, which is probably, you know, one of the greatest progressive rock bands of all time. You know, I was fortunate that that kind of gave me another career, I suppose. And so coming back and working with someone like Chris, we sort of met in the middle, I think. It was a, a combination of him working with all these uh, mainstream artists and me being more... Uh, you know, on, on the progressive side, so it, it's a. I think it's an interesting fusion of of two two areas of music that um, you know the Dallas Brady Association is very much uh, shows that collaboration. Now, what is it like to work with someone? As you said, he's uh, Chris is a big fan of uh, Buggles. What is it to work with someone who admires your work? I mean, in one, it must be exhilarating because this person is a big fan of your work. But two, do you, do, do you think you ever got a little intimidated because you are Jeff Downs? <laughs> well, it's funny actually because I, you know, I think Chris has often said that you know when he, when he sent me ideas and he, he you know, I, I've sent him initial ideas and stuff like that. He's always said that you know he really wanted to make sure that you know I liked it, you know what he was coming up with. And I think that there's a reciprocal thing there that you know when I was sending him these ideas. Uh, the initial kind of, uh, I suppose, just these little snippets of ideas. I think that I wanted him to like them. You know, I wanted him to think that you know he could, um, you know, could do something with them. So it, it, I think it, whoever you're working with in any kind of collaboration, uh, certainly when I was working with John Wetton, you know, I have a long writing relationship with John. You know, you, you want to please the other person. You know, you want to. You want them to like what you're putting forward, so so that um, you know you've got this kind of respect and uh, empathy with that person. And and I think that Chris and I really have that together. You know, I think we have that empathy. And depending on you know, I'm a big admirer of what he's done. He's he's done some amazing things in recent years. Um, certainly very successful uh, in terms of his mainstream work. So. It's it's those sort of swings and roundabouts really. You get you get off on working with certain people, and um, it certainly you know it certainly worked for me and Chris. 
Well, the thing I like is it's an album. You know, we're 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 at a time where you know if you talk to someone young, they don't even know what an album is. They don't they don't they've never experienced the joy. You know, I mean, you would when you you know you play with Yes and you know Yes always had the great album covers, which was also your new album cover for Halcyon on Hymns, the same artist. What what was your thought process when you put the album together and made it you know track by track? Because we're in such a time where people just buy singles. But you know, us older people like listening to the whole album. What what was your? Well, that, yeah, I think that was one of the things that drew drew Chris and I together because Chris, you know, we're both big vinyl fans and we're, we're both big uh, fans of the album. But, you know, rather than it just being a collection of songs, you know, how we approached House and the Hymns is much more uh, along the lines of it being an album. You know, so that you could actually. Uh, you know, take that away. I mean, the vinyl won't be released for another month or so, but, you know, we, we, we conceived it, I think, as an album so that it's not just somebody cherry-picking, uh, you know, tracks off off it here, there, and, you know, saying, oh, whatever, you know, a nice couple of tracks on that album. Um, you know, we, we'd like people to get into the album as a whole, and I think that, you know, with this whole pandemic, people being at home a lot, you know, people... Uh, maybe listen to music, not not just uh, downloading, you know, one track from here, one track from there. You know, it's, it gives people the perspective of being able to sit down and and actually listen to a whole album. And I think that that's what was very much in in our minds that we wanted to uh, project that idea through that we we were working on an album rather than it being uh, just a collection of songs. And I like that, you know, and I, I believe I saw you at the Greek with Yes, and you guys played a whole album, and um, and it's good. I mean, you sit there, um, and you, you sit back, and you're right, especially now during this pandemic, it's like I try to listen to an album every other day, from beginning to yeah, end, right. not just tracks. Yeah, I think that it's, it's important. I think that's one of the things that, you know, really helps you know, when I, when I got back into Yes 10 years ago, I think, it, you know, we went out and we started doing all these albums. And, you know, I think that it, it's, it's interesting when you, 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 you listen to them, even if it's just from a, a musicology standpoint, that you, you get an idea of how these albums were put together. You know, and maybe, you know, those tracks that people didn't really initially like or, or didn't, you know, they, that they wouldn't particularly put any significance to it when you when you perform an album as a whole or you listen to an album as a whole you know you realize that every every track has a kind of you know a place in there whether it be something that is instantly commercial or appealing you know sometimes sometimes the, the, the deeper cuts on albums are the ones that people you know really relate to uh, when once the album is kind of permeated into their psyche so yeah, I mean, uh, I'm, a, I'm a big album idealist myself. I like to think that, you know, albums are for listening and, and for people to get immersed in the experience. Now, how did your whole career start? As I say, you've been, you're, you're iconic. I mean, you know, I mean, you know, people, you were in the first video on MTV. You were in Asia, which was such a huge band. And then, yes, how did, when did you know you wanted to play music? Well, I, I started pretty young. I think that, both my parents were musical. My, my dad was a church organist, and I used to go and turn the pages over for him when I was really young, and I was singing in choirs and things like that. So it was um, it was something that I, I was in my blood, I suppose. And um, and I, I, I even from a very quite an early age, I felt that you know music was very much an important part of me. And I, I, you know, as time went by, I wanted to make that more and more. Uh, something that, you know, if I could make a career out of doing something that I love doing, then, you know, I'd, I'd be very happy. And, uh, and and I still, today, I still regard it as a privilege that I've been able to, you know, continue and make music and, uh, and, and you know, not just make a living out of it, but also, you know, working with all these great people that I've managed to, uh, to meet over the years. And, you know, when you think about these iconic musicians like Chris Squire and, uh, and Greg Lake and you know, John Wett and uh, people that I've written with closely. Um, it's been 
you know, it's been a great thing to be able to do. And so, you know, I, I always felt that there was something that, you know, it was a, a something of a calling that, you know, if I could get that opportunity, I would, I would definitely do it. Now, how did Boggles come about? Because, you know, I know you said you were in music school. When did you meet Trevor? How did it whole and it come about? Well, when, when I finished uh, music college and I moved to London, which was probably the only place you could be if you were really trying to make, you know, make a living in the, in the music scene, because, the, you know, every, everything in London was centered around London, all the record labels, um, you know, all the session work and all that kind of thing was in London. So, so I moved there and I, I, I was answering advertisements in, for Musicians Wanted in the, uh, the now defunct Melody Maker, which was the, like the sort of Musicians Bible at the time. And, um, and I answered an ad for a chart act that wanted a keyboard player. Uh, and it just so happened that Trevor was the guy putting the band together. And, um, and he, he obviously liked what I was doing and gave me the job. And so we, we started backing this disco singer at the time, a disco singer called Tina Charles. And we started to get more working together. And, and we, you know, I was doing quite a bit of session work and so was he. And so we'd give each other sessions and that kind of thing. And then we, we sort of got thrown together. And, and I think that we, we, we had felt we had something that we could achieve together. And, um, and so the puzzles really stemmed out of that, and, and uh, when we started writing together and started putting these songs together, it was it was obvious that we, you know, we had something, but whether what what it was, we didn't know at the time, obviously. Now, you record video killed the radio star, and and back then, you know, videos they weren't huge. I mean, I know a lot of people in England had them. In America, we didn't have a lot of uh, music videos. What made you decide to make that video? And and it has a, it had a different look. I mean, wh where did that all come from? Did that come from you and Trevor collaborating for that whole the video and the scene, or did you have a director do that? Well, no, I think we, um, we you know at that time, and that's going back to when when it was first released was uh, towards the end of nine seventy nine. I think that. You know, at that time, video was starting to become something that people were very interested in, as the, particularly the record labels, as a promotional tool. Because I think that it was a, it was a way of putting things around the world to all the different record labels to show what act you know what an act was doing. And I think that it started to get very artistic and creative. And I think the record company, when we, when we delivered the final masters of Video Killed the Radio Star uh, and, and the other singles, um, they felt that you know, it justified spending quite a lot of money on, on getting a, you know, one of these budding directors in to do a creative video for us. So it was, all, it was literally all done in a day. And I think you know, the actual shooting of it, but the, the, the director who went on and did a lot of stuff with Duran Duran and Elton John and uh, he directed the Highlander films, a guy called Russell Mulcahy. He, um, he, uh, he really pushed the boat out on it, I think, because he spent, I think he spent a week editing it and, um, and came up with this sort of wacky uh, presentation for us. And we were very thrilled with it because, you know, to have a video like that, we, we didn't have a band. We, we were just two guys uh, who were out there doing these TV shows and stuff like that. And, and to be able to have this video, it was fairly groundbreaking at the time. Um, it was something that, you know, I think it was a, a very valuable promotional tool for not just the record label, but for us as well. Well, it's amazing, you know, it's, and I'm sure when you made the video, you never thought that, you know, it would be so many people ask that trivia question. You know, because, you know, who was with his first video on MTV? And it really amazes me. I mean... Yeah, it's even, it's even a question on Trivial Pursuit. You know, it's, I think once you <laughs> made it into Trivial Pursuit, you know, you're sort of, uh, you're etched in stone, really. <laughs> now, now, how did, you know, and I, I, I saw you in, uh, with Yes in Philly. Um, it was in the round, I believe, at the Spectrum. How did you transition? What was the transition from Buggles to Yes? Because both you and Trevor went. Well, I think it was... Um, it, it was a 
bit more of a natural process than maybe some might believe. I, I think it, you know the, the planets aligned. Chris, um, Steve, and Alan had just finished um, some recordings in in Paris with the other two guys, with uh, John Anderson, Rick Wakeman, uh, and and it didn't really work out. I don't think. I think Roy Thomas Baker was producing. Um, John and and uh, Rick have uh, left, and so the other three guys were left holding the, the baby, and they happened to be managed by the same management company as we managing the bubbles, uh, Trevor and myself, and and we got to meet them in the offices and got talking to them, and uh, Chris had heard the album and thought it was a great album, uh, the Age of Plastic album, and so he said, you know, if you guys have got any material you'd like to push our way, feel free and we'll, um, you know, we'll have a look at it. So Trevor and I had some songs that we thought might be, you know, more suited to Yes than was maybe suited to the Buggles. And so we got in a rehearsal room with them and started playing around with these ideas. And, you know, eventually they said, well, you know, you're a singer, you're a keyboard player. Um, why don't we, why don't we do a, a Yes album? You know, and that was it really. It was, it, it came out quite naturally. It wasn't anything that was forced or, or anything like that. But of course, you know, it, it created something of a, uh, you know, there were quite some heavy repercussions with the, you know, with the Yes fan base because they saw, saw these, uh, you know, these charlatan pop guys coming into their <laughs> revered band and, um, uh, you know, some kind of, kind of taking over what they, you know, they, 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 a lot of them didn't really want to see it without, um, Anderson or, 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 or Wakeman but you know having said that I think that the album we came up with was, was very very strong and I think you know quite a lot of people were surprised that drama when it came out had you know a lot of uh, a lot of yes elements to it but at the same time it had this sort of modern age that I think Trevor and I brought to the equation uh, and I think that in many ways cemented the, the whole thing together now, what was it like when you started touring with them? Because all of a sudden you're playing, well, first of all, you're playing in the round, and I don't know, I mean, I've never played in the round. I don't know what it's like, if it feels different than playing on a regular stage. But all of a sudden you're playing these packed houses. I mean, that must have been a great feeling as a musician just to feel that energy. Well, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, being a, a keyboard player, musician from the background that I'd had, <laughs> you know, being with a band like Yes was really a total honor because... You know, if you're you know a working musician, to be in a band like that was really, you know, incredible um, appraisal of your your, your your skills or whatever. You know, and I think that to be put on that stage with those guys who I'd really looked up to for, for you know quite a few years before that, um, uh, and then the same. You know, Trevor had the same kind of attitude that you know to put us on that stage with those guys in front of all those people, it was really, you know, I suppose it was a baptism of fire in some respects because uh, we'd gone from just being these two guys who were, you know, messing around in the studio to, you know, being on the stage with uh, some of the, you know, one of the greatest bands in the world and being with some of the greatest musicians in the world. So it was a, it was a fantastic um, feeling, for sure. And I remember the first, I think the Philadelphia gig was probably about six or seven gigs along, but we started at the Toronto Maple Leaf Gardens, which, again, that's not there anymore. And then I think the third show, we were at Madison Square Garden for three nights in New York. So you can imagine the, you know, the, this whole transition of being from, you know, just a guy in the studio to, to being on that state of the Madison Square Garden for three nights, you know, was, uh, was an incredible um, feeling. And, uh, something that really stayed with me and from that point on I think that's that's something that I always wanted to do and um, you know I think that Trevor and I both felt that you know being in a pop band's one thing like the Buggles was, was was only going to be you know was not going to be that long lived and, and to be able to get into you know a band that had got such a heritage and, and, and such a future you know like yes was something that we couldn't really um, you know we couldn't really turn down so yes, broke up, and then you decide to form Asia. Which you know, when you look at back at it, Asia, you know, they they call they call a lot of bands supergroups. Asia 
was a super group. I mean, there is so much talent. I mean, you know, Steve Howe, John Wetton, uh, you, Carl Palmer. I mean, it was a super group. How, how did you guys get each other on the same page and put that together? relationship with John Wetton in writing? Did you do most of the music and he did the lyrics? How did you work it? Because, you know, you wrote, you guys wrote a majority of the work. What was your relationship? How did you formulate those great songs like Heat of the Moment, Only Time Will Tell? Well, I think what happened was when we were rehearsing, you know, it was a case of people putting forward stuff and we were rehearsing Vocalist who's a lead vocalist has got to really believe in what he's singing about, and I think that 
you know, when you hear that first album, you know, you can hear the commitment of, the, of, the, of John's lead vocal, you know, because he's, he's singing what he believes in, and it's all in his register. That was a thing that we were very concerned about as well, that, you know, we were, you know, he was, he was playing himself, you know, not, not, not someone else. And so I think that's how we crafted the songs, was, was around John's voice, around, you know, some of my arrangements and my keyboard playing and my parts and, and my harmonic movement and all that kind of thing. It, you know, we could analyze it uh, ad infinitum, but, you know, for us, it was very, very natural. When did you start writing songs? At what age? I mean, you know, you, you're, you're inclined to music when you were younger. When did you sit there and start writing music, and, and what did you draw from? Well, I think I, I, I used to just fiddle around. With, you know, we had the piano at home, and I used to fiddle around on that. And, you know, I, I started to get a taste of not just reading music, but actually coming up with stuff that was in my head, you know. And I think that... Uh, it was uh, it was very fortuitous because by the time you know I, I sort of left school, I did um, you know studied music at school and stuff like that, and I left uh, I left school and I was putting you know I had a little bit of time where I was doing some writing, and and when I went for my uh, interview for the music college in Leeds, uh, I, I I played some of my own music, you know, and I think that. The, the, the guys who were interviewing me, it was quite a, a radical music college at the time because it, it concentrated more on modern music rather than it being, you know, like one of these really sort of classical orientated um, uh, music colleges. It was quite uh, groundbreaking stuff at the time. And the, and the, and the, the, the lecturers that, that heard me put this together were, were really complimentary and said, you know, that's, that's great, you brought your own music along, because that, that, uh, that's what it's all about, you know, it's creating something new, creating what, you know, being yourself. And, and that gave me the confidence, I think, to, to go on and think, well, you know, maybe that's the way to go, is to play yourself, you know, not to be just reading other people's music, but to actually, you know, get something that comes from within. Now, with Asia, the originally, guys, you separated in with '86. What? What was? Why did you guys separate? Um, I think that by that time we'd had, you know, the, the personnel changes that we'd had. Um, you know, John left and, and Greg Lake came in, and we did this big broadcast from uh, MTV uh, in Japan, and then uh, Steve left and John came back in. You know, there was a little bit of friction between. Uh, most of the members of the band. I think one of the problems was that we, we, it was so big, so fast that we were, you know, we we started at the top, and it was, you know, it was really hard to sustain that. And uh, you know, it affects people in different ways. I think it affected me as well. You know, the fact that we were, you know, working in a rehearsal studio, then we went into the main recording studio. And, we didn't know how well that first album was going to do, and then all of a sudden, you know, it exploded on the scene. You know, Asia was the biggest thing since sliced bread. You know, certainly for, for that year in America. So it was, um, it was, it, it, it has, you know, it's a, it's a double-edged sword in some ways because the success is fantastic, but then it does provide its own problems. And we were, I think, probably caught in the record company who wanted, you know. They wanted our second album to be bigger than the first one, even you know. And I think the expectations suddenly started to go out, get a bit out of hand. And so we went when we went in and did Alpha, and, and that really changed the whole perspective. I mean, I think it's a good album, but you know, it changed the way that people viewed us and people viewed themselves internally. So we had these personnel changes. Then you know, we plowed on and we did the third album, Master, which again, you know, a lot of fans really um, really like that album but you know I think by that time we, you know, we, we lost a lot of steam and um, uh, the record label started to get a little bit um, you know, they were moving on to other things and so we weren't the priority that we had been uh, two or three years earlier uh, and, and it's all down to the label you know if you, if you haven't got that support it's very very hard to you know to keep playing along and so I think we thought we'd take a, you know, we take a bit of time out from it, and 
and that was 1986. I, I moved into doing more record production and stuff like that. Um, Carl was starting to talk about going back and working with um, with ELP, and, and John was doing his solo stuff in in the uh, states. So we, we it wasn't really a falling out as such. We just we just moved on to different aspects of our careers, and uh, uh, and that was it really. And obviously, you know, time carried on, and we we, we came back together again briefly in 1990 with three of us, which was Carl, John and myself, um, uh, we did another album for Geffen uh, called Then and Now, but it was more, it was more a retrospective thing rather than it being, you know, a new thing, and uh, and so that, you know, we, we did we did quite a few gigs around Europe, and uh, uh, we got Pat Thrall in, the guitarist, and it was, it was, uh, it was, you know, it, it was, it was great, but at the same time, you know, I think that we all, all felt that maybe the, the you know the, the, the weight of uh, what what we were doing with Asia, it was time to um, to put it on the shelf for, for the time being. And then I mean you you've gone through different lineups in Asia. You know you guys the original lineup got back uh, a few uh, what years ago. How did how did that come about? Well, I think by the time we'd all gone off and done various things, I mean you know I got off and, and I. I, I carried on Asia to some degree with uh, with, with John Payne, and you know we did a few albums uh, under that banner. John was working on his solo material; um, he, he was living out in LA. Um, Carl had gone back to ELP. Steve was back with Yes. So you know, in many ways, it was um, you know we'd all gone we'd all gone back to you know our separate ways, and and I think that by the time so it came around to 2004, 2005. I started working with John again on a, on a, on a, on a project called Icon, and uh, and we realised that you know we were we could still write some great stuff together, and and uh, and that in many ways precipitated the reunion, which started in 2000, late 2005, early 2006, um, because I think that by that time. You know, John, who'd had his problems with alcohol and stuff like that, he, he really um, he, he cleaned his act up and he, he completely, um, you know, became totally clean and straight. Uh, and, and that, you know, was one of the factors, I think, that, that enabled us to get back together again. And also, uh, you know, Steve and, and Yes were not really that operational at that point. Uh, Carl and, and the LP were not that person. So, um, you know, at, at that time, I think we felt that, you know, maybe now is the time we can get together and and, um, and do something, you know, collectively again. And, you know, almost like we had unfinished business. And so it was great, you know, we got together in one room, the four of us, and, you know, and said, right, well, you know, let's do a tour, see how that works out. You know, play the old stuff, and, uh, you know, and, and that developed into, well, maybe we should do another album. So we did the Phoenix album, and then, you know, we did more touring, and then uh, quite extensively did another album, more touring, another album. So we got into this uh, pattern, I think, of um, from from that point, of right up to about 2013, where, um, you know, we did considerable amount of work with Asia and people we did um, three studio albums, a uh, number of recording concerts, live stuff. Uh, and I think at that point Steve, you know, was finding it too much pressure to be well, operating in two bands at the same time. Um, and you know, he had his solo stuff that he was working on as well. So, you know, Steve sort of opted out at that point and we carried on, we did another album called Gravitas in uh, 2014. And, um, you know, at that point, I think that we, we still thought Asia had, you know, we toured, we, 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 we carried on the name. And I think it was important for us all to, to keep Asia going. And, uh, you know, which we were working on another album and then sadly John got really sick. And, uh, you know, so sadly he, uh, he passed away in early 2017. So it was, um, you know, 
we, I think we did what we intended to do in many ways was to, you know, was to revisit Asia and, you know, really put it put it back on the map because I, I, I think that we finished too soon. We, 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 we stopped when we should have really carried on, maybe. But, you know, it's all hindsight. Well, that's awesome, Jeff. Uh, you know, I, you've had such a great music uh, history, and, and I appreciate you taking the time to talk to me. Um, the the album is is great, the Halcyon Hymns. Um, you're on social media. What's what's your Twitter handle? Um, I'm Asia Jeff. A S I A G E O F M. Okay. Well, people, check out Jeff. Uh, check out me on Twitter at Cooper Talk. Go to my website, CooperTalk.net. Remember, I'm Steve Cooper. I'm only as hip as my guest. Don't forget, drink your water, eat your vegetables, take your vitamins, and I'll talk to you next time.